Hello, everyone, and welcome to a presentation on how we got the internet to EMF camp this year and how we almost didn't, and we got away with it by the skin of our teeth. Um, so this time, in an attempt to make things a little easier, um, we had quite a lot of preparation and set up before the camp actually uh, started. Um, then there's going to be a section on the uplink actually getting into here, getting to here. Uh, then a bit more detail on the course network and the data center. Um, and then a little bit on the wired network and AK47 here is going to give us a presentation on the wireless. Um, so this is several weeks before the camp began, uh, a group of us coming to the site with a spotter scope attempting to demonstrate that we can get line of sight to the data center. I'm just going to hold this to the data center where we uh, actually get the internet connection from. It's a distance of about seven kilometers. And um, looking at maps and things, we can get a, a height profile of uh, just to see if there's any obstructions in the way. But that isn't guaranteed to work because of uh, things like trees and buildings. The height profile may be out of date and may not be particularly brilliantly accurate. Um, obviously, to get to be able to see something seven kilometers away, it needs to be fairly large and visible. So uh, uh, Nin at London Hackspace very generously made us this uh, two meter by three meter fluorescent green and black flag, which turned out to be extremely useful. Uh, this is um, about a week before the camp with a pair of cherry, cherry pickers one with the big flag on it at the data center end and one at the camp end, attempting to see if we could see the link. Um, and at that point, we actually couldn't. We could see things near where we thought the link was, but not the actual data center site itself. So we were confident, but not 100% certain. Um, that was a bit of a mistake. Uh, this is the site where we were going to put the mast at the data center end. Um, all this builder's rubble and sand is where the mast's going to go. Um, and we were told, it's all going to be moved. No problem. Don't worry about it. <coughs> um, because we got large numbers of devices on the campsite to be configured, setting them all up by hand would be a pain in the neck. So um, we had uh, some a Google Docs spreadsheet that had all the relevant IP addresses and details of which devices were linked to which. And then there was a, a bunch of Python scripts that downloaded those details, uh, took a template file, and generated all the configurations for the switches. Uh, we also needed to wipe old configurations off the switches and upgrade them to the latest version of iOS. And so there's some extra code there to do that that kind of works, but not brilliantly. Um, th this is just a, 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 quick, a quick example. Um, so if the switch has a port prefix, there's different switches. Some used to have fast Ethernet ports and some have gigabit Ethernet. So we had to take that into account. And then it goes through a loop um, for each port in the, the camper network and puts in all the configuration stuff. There's loads of extra stuff in there we've missed out. Um, what else we got in here? Oops. Uh, yeah, if, if anyone knows of any existing scripts to do this kind of thing, um, it would be nice to know what they were. Um, so we couldn't find anything, and it seems like the kind of thing that someone else has to have written at some point. Um, because we weren't certain about the, the line of sight link, we decided that rather than having the mast at the camp end right next to the camp, is to put it far up the hill and run fiber up to it um, so that we have more flexibility in positioning it and to try and avoid trees and things in the middle. So come Wednesday, uh, when we're on site for the first time, if I just out tab back to this, uh, we come to the data center. Oh, and there's a network diagram there, which you can't read, and a cabling diagram, which you can't read either. But anyway, it, it gives you some idea of the complexity. The, the, the kind of the squares on the edges are the individual dat and close with the core in the middle. Um, so we found that at the data center, the rubble and sand hadn't been moved, so we couldn't actually put the mast there. Um, we then spent the morning running around all the local car parks and businesses saying, please, can we put a 26-meter mast in your car park? Uh, quite surprisingly, most people said no. Um, <coughs> luckily, we found uh, a garage down the end of this alleyway here where um, they were very friendly and said, yeah, you can shove a mast there. So this is the mast up on Wednesday night with a flag flying on top of it so that come Thursday, hopefully, we can uh, get a visual line from the camp and get it sorted out. Um, what else have I got in here? Um, there was another plan on Thursday morning uh, called Plan P uh, for prayer, which is to try and relay the signal from the roof of St. Mary's Church, Bletchley. Um, when we contacted them, they, they said no, but they said it so nicely, I thought it was worth mentioning. <laughs> on Thursday, we had a 32-meter access platform, which is a, a huge truck. 
uh, which had difficulty getting up the alley but got up there in the end. And we, we had that for Thursday only. If we couldn't make the link work then, then uh, we wouldn't have internet at all. Uh, back to that one. Uh, th this is the view from the top of the cherry picker towards the camp. I don't know if you've looked up the back of the hill here, but you can see uh, just about on the left here, there are two shorter masts, and they're not visible on this slide, is there's one very tall, thin mast, um, which has been put in by the farmer with some anemometers and some data logging, because they're trying to work out whether it's economically viable to put a wind turbine in here. Um, on the left, left here, and you probably can't see it, but you can just about see a gray thing at an angle, which is the mast at the camp end, kind of halfway up, because it's in the process of being er erected. And below it, there's a kind of grayish, greenish blob, which is a Land Rover for driving people up there to sort out the mast. Um, let's see if that works better. <coughs> um, we also needed to get from the, the mast at the data center end back to the data center. That was over 100 meters, so it wasn't possible with Cat 5, so we needed to get a roll of fiber. Luckily, we had a, a spare, untested, 140-meter roll. So we used that, unrolled it all the way, and as we were unrolling it, discovered that in several places it was broken, and that uh, all the fibers were cut apart from two, and those two uncut ones didn't work either. So we had to call back to the camp for a spare roll, get it run round, unroll it all, <clears throat> all the while frantically trying to get the link up and running. But luckily, we got it running in the end. So we had, from the data center, 150 meters of fiber running along a, a rubbish and reed, re, uh, weed strewn bank to a, a garage tire and spare parts store, which had a switch and the power injectors for the radios. And after all that, at uh, a kind of sundown on Thursday, we were just about to be able to get internet to the camp. On the campsite, we also had lots of problems because we discovered that the, uh, the fiber running from the mast to the campsite was also broken and needed re-splicing. Uh, which luckily we had a splicing kit on site, so we were able to get that fixed. Fixed. Mm, oops. Uh, th this is the DK way up on the hill, uh, getting lonely on its own. To the left here is um, a, a sort of lighting mast tower with a built-in generator. Luckily, that had some spare sockets on it, so we were able to use that to power the DK. Uh, at this end, we don't need the full height of the mast, so it's only up a little bit. Uh, which makes it easy to deal with. This is the uh, on-camp data center in a refrigerated shipping container. Uh, we didn't bother with racks. Everything's just sitting on pallets. Unfortunately, being refrigerated, um, it's the maximum temperature it, it could go up to was only 10 degrees C, so it got fairly cold. We had problems with condensation, and we had a, a high-tech solution with a bucket. <clears throat> this is the usual things. Core switch, uh, a distribution switch, and the all-important wireless controller some virtual machine servers for the on-camp services, and a big mess of cables. Um, and now we're on to wireless. So yes, wireless. Um, uh, in terms of hardware, you had this year uh, an Aruba 2710 controllers, which uh, can handle up to 512 access points and has uh, four times 10G. Uh, we uplinked uh, the uh, wireless LAN controller with 1 times 10G to the um, uh, Cisco 6500 core switch we had over here. Uh, we didn't actually need that 10 gig because we only hit like 300 megabits or so, but yeah, well, if you can uplink it with 10 gig, then you should, right? <laughs> Um, we had about uh, 50 dual radio 802.11 and um, Aruba access points, and then another 10 dual radio 802.11 AC access points. Um, the software we were uh, using is uh, free radius for most of the uh, 802.1x networks. Then we also had the Aruba Airwave management suite, which we used for uh, monitoring and gathering statistics and that kind of stuff. Uh, and we also had uh, graphite running to make some pretty graphs, which we will show later. Uh, in the picture, you can see uh, in the middle the 2710 controller with the uh, 10 gigabit uplink. Uh, on the top here, we have a um, AP275, which is an outdoor access point from, uh, from Aruba, with, uh, which has uh, six integrated uh, antennas. Um, so it's not actually a security camera, it is actually an access point, so you might have uh, seen them deployed over the side. 
And at the bottom, which is an access point, which is actually hanging in this room, which is an AP225, which is a dual radio 8211AC access point. Um, oh, this might be a bit hard to read, but the, this is the <laughs> config we've deployed. So we had separate SSIDs for, um, for the EMF camp SSID on 2.4 gigahertz and on 5 gigahertz. Um, most of the networks were uh, encrypted with WPA2 Enterprise 802.1x encryption. We, the authentication was being sent to a free radio server. This free, free radio server also had a uh, uplink with the um, uh, top server, for, uh, uh, well, the server for SpaceNet and a server for Edurome. So we were, uh, we were um, next to the EMF camp SSIDs, also offering uh, SpaceNet and Edurome. They are both serving the same cost, so it's a uh, federated authentication. So if you are either a member at a local hackerspace or if you are a student at a university and you got an account at that university or hackerspace, then you can use Adorome or SpaceNet. So if you already have that configured on your device, then uh, if you head over here to the campsite, you don't have to configure anything anymore on your device. So if you already have something that configured, it will just work. So you don't need to set anything up. So that's uh, well, pretty good for the ease of use uh, of, the, uh, of the users. Um, so we are tunneling all of the traffic through the um, Aruba wireless LAN controller. Um, the reason we are doing this is mostly for uh, easier AP deployment because the um, access point just needs to get an IP address in uh, random VLAN so it can build a tunnel back to the controller. Um, and that also means we don't have to, have to stretch any VLANs across the site. Across the site. Um, and this also gives us the opportunity to do a lot of uh, uh, broadcast filtering because the uh, Aruba controller has features like an uh, ARP proxy and a neighbor discovery uh, proxy. So, uh, and we want to filter broadcast traffic because that is um, usually at this scale is killing for the uh, overall wireless uh, wireless performance. Um, we ran uh, with a four channel plan on uh, 2.4 gigahertz with 20 megahertz channels and then with a 19 channel plan on 5 gigahertz. Um, we had about 10 access points uh, dedicated configured for air monitoring. So those access points are doing uh, dedicated background scanning, uh, doing um, rogue detection, and doing uh, intrusion prevention and intrusion detection. So um, I'm not sure if this map is a bit readable, but this map should, sh uh, should show the positions of all of the access points across the field. So uh, each data and had had uh, uh, an access point and in the, this stage tens, multiple access points are deployed. So we, uh, over here we have five access points with uh, one access point configured as an air monitor. Uh, the reason we are placing more access points in a stage like this is mainly for capacity because um, this stage is, a, well, it could fit like 300 people or something. So we need more uh, access points to uh, serve that kind of capacity. So uh, in this photo, you'll see um, the inside of a data flow with on the bottom, uh, the Cisco switch, which is uh, in most cases also can do uh, power over ethernet. And on the top, we have a Aruba AP134. Uh, on the right, we have a AP275, which is placed on this C field. So you might have seen it. We deployed that yesterday because we had some problems with coverage on 5 gig over there. So statistics. Um, we had, um, well, the number we, I got this from was uh, about two hours back. Uh, we had uh, 2012 unique uh, MAC addresses seen. We had a peak of uh, 1,090 concurrent associations. Uh, Seventy-five percent of the clients are uh, smart devices, either smartphone or like a tablet. Uh, Fifty percent of that is Android. Twenty-five percent is uh, Apple iOS. 
and then a way lower number are the uh, laptops, like 7% uh, on Linux, 7% on Mac OS, and 3% on Windows. Um, usage of the uh, SSIDs, so we had 33% on EMF Camp, 30% on EMF Camp Insecure, 25% on EMF Camp Legacy, 7% on Eduroam, and 2% on SpaceNet. Um, so this uh, graph shows the um, uh, aggregated usage of a couple of SSIDs because we had multiple SSIDs running on WPA2 Enterprise. Um, the, um, uh, it shows basically over here, there's a way uh, larger amount of people using encryption versus un 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 the unencrypted network. So this pretty much shows that people do care about encryption and they, well, really should. So um, 2.4 gigahertz versus 5 gigahertz. Uh, the distribution is about 50-50. Um, we still saw a lot of clients that were actually 5 gigahertz capable still connecting on 2.4 gigahertz. Um, we were able to detect this on the wireless LAN controllers because the, uh, the Aruba access points can detect um, using uh, when they're uh, seeing probe requests from different devices so they can mark them as 5 gigahertz capable. Um, so this, the reason for this might be due to user error, so the user is connecting to the 2.4 gigahertz SSID while he really should be connecting to the 5 gigahertz SSID. Um, band steering can be a problem or um, the device is not capable of using the DFS channels. So this is already the higher number of um, 5 gigahertz channel above channel uh, 44, um, oh, sorry, 48. Uh, on this, uh, these five gigahertz channels, you have to do radar detection, and some devices cannot do this. Um, yeah, this graph shows the um, the uh, channel utilization, so the amount of uh, 802 uh frames we are seeing on a certain channel, and here we can see that we have a, have a, uh, about 40%. Um, average utilization of the 2.4 gigahertz band versus 10% on the 5 gigahertz band. Um, certain radios are uh, peaking at 100%, that, uh, so that means the 2.4 gigahertz channel is completely exhausted. Um, so this is the traffic we did on the wireless LAN controller. We had a peak up to uh, 300 megabits. Um, well, this is also an interesting graph because you can, uh, it's a bit hard to see actually, but um, so the, the brown area here is uh, um, the amount of client associations in stage A. So you can see over time where people are moving. So when the talk is done, you can see them moving away from stage A and then going back to the A field to milliways or something like that. Um, so you want to take over for this one, or? <laughs> well, we, we can do it together. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so. We, oh, sorry. <laughs> so. Uh, we have support from uh, many different vendors. It, it really takes a lot of, a lot of organization and help to get this kind of thing running. Um, Bytemark loaned us a lot of equipment and also did some uh, uh, data center hosting for us. Uh, Comtech also loaned us a lot of equipment. Uh, and also David C's time, which he gave extremely generously, uh, and also gave us some server hosting. Rapid Wireless is who we hired the, the wireless link back to the data center from, and they also help with uh, deployment. Colocker uh, gave us our internet link and also data center access. Again, without them, we couldn't have made the, the camp couldn't have happened. Uh, Flex, op Flex Optics, as usual, uh, loaned us uh, for free a load of SFPs and GBICs, uh, which are vital for linking all the access switches together. And Aruba loaned us the Wi-Fi kit. They did loan some, yeah. Um, uh, LearnUp provided the uplink, and so did Sargasso Networks. Um, and that's it, I think. Any questions? <laughs> Lots of questions. Uh, Martin. Yeah, so in this case, we're getting a lot of uh, sponsored access points, so we need to um, do it what we have. So all of these access points have omnidirectional antennas, so it, I would definitely agree it's better to use directional antennas, but 
we simply don't have them available. So we need to, um, yeah, well, make make the best of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Um, pretty low actually, but we don't have that many AC access points deployed, so it's hard to detect. But um, I would say it's about uh, well, I think we saw about 50 of them. So you have you it mostly are smartphones on the Wi-Fi network. So there are the Galaxy S4, which uh, which are, is 11 AC capable. So it's mostly that kind of devices we we saw. But uh, in the in the next coming years, we're going to see a lot of AC clients. So that is actually good news that that means a lot of more 5 gig usage so we can finally throw away this crappy 2.4 gig band <laughs> and move to 5 gig completely but yeah yeah how much bandwidth we use um bit hard to s do we could look that up actually but um we could yeah. we could put off from graph not, not enough as usual <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so I, I would, I would say it is. A, we had, a, we had hit an average about like 100 megabits, something. something like so, that. if you calculate 100 megabits over 84 hours, then that should give you a uh, fair number of, uh, of of data uses. Uh, total, to, to, yeah, I would say total, like total upstream plus downstream was uh, average about 100 megabits. I would say, yeah. Um, I think you in the middle had a question. Uh, I can't remember. Will, do you know? <laughs> <coughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's quite a common question. Um, so the, the microwave link is um, something like 430 megabits as installed. Um, we had, like, basically it's all gig links around for the actual transit network. So, um, and to be honest, I haven't had a chance to look at the graphs, so I can't answer the question about how much, <laughs> how much traffic we use because no, I haven't looked. Yeah. Oh, it's mo it mostly all on Wi Fi, though. The, uh, mm. Cool. Yeah. Uh, was there anyone else? Any more hands going up? Really, no more questions? Nothing? Right. Great. I can go get a beer. Oh, oh, oh you've got oh, a question. Yeah. <laughs> how, how many cables did you have to plug in in the Dutton Club? For network. For network. Uh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah, 22. 22, yeah. 22. Yeah. On the uh, wireless network, um, number of connections, there was like four or five large downward spikes. Uh, do you know what that was from? Uh, mostly power outage uh, at a large part of the field. <laughs> yeah, so basically stage B and a large part of the A, B, C, D, E field. So uh, that's... Those are the spikes. <laughs> Just a bit of fun. I had to do a live recycling from my game to uh, someone who was in the high density port. Just over 40 miles. How did we establish live recycling? Two megabits of flash that were both great. Sorry, I didn't hear the last bit. How did he? Two megabits. Two megabits. <laughs> We were looking at things like strobes and stuff like that, um, but it, it, looking down into the city from up here, uh, I went up up there in the cherry picker on the hill, like 17 meters up on uh, Tuesday night, um, and it's damn cold up there actually, um, and uh, it's very difficult to make stuff out amongst the backdrop of the city. It's it's um uh, it's I I kind of feel it's easier to do it in the day. Um, but yeah, it's, it's um, worth worth thinking about. It's quite difficult to kind of sometimes do things like that in the middle, up a mast, thirty meters up, and you've got to wind it up. It's a. It's a I have them and you're welcome. To <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Dimitri. Uh, to Jasper, actually. So. <laughs> so, so Jasper is running the UK node for SpaceNet. So 
If you have a um, hackerspace in the UK, talk to Jasper to be connected to SpaceNet. If you have a hackerspace somewhere else in Europe, um, talk to us. There is a, also a country node in, in Germany and one in Luxembourg. Um, we're currently in the Netherlands doing the rest of the hackerspaces in the rest of Europe uh, who wants to get connected. So by all means, if you want to get connected to SpaceNet and you want to uh, have this awesome roaming experience between uh, hackerspaces and this kind of events, then uh, please uh, contact us. Uh, okay, thank you everyone. Thank you.